and I'm Layla. Welcome back to our channel, Elementary My Dear, where we make nutrition science easy for you to digest. So today we're talking about the body mass index. The BMI. There's been quite a bit of controversy about the BMI. And if you want to stay up to date with all the controversies we cover, make sure to hit that subscribe <laughs> You got it in. That was very smooth. Thank that you. was very smooth. Thank I'm you. Impressed. I'm not going to lie, I did forget, but then <laughs> I remember. It, so. reco it was a smooth recovery. I think the BMI recently has been getting a lot of attention. Um, people are calling to question its validity. People are talking about, you know, the origins of it. Is it still useful? Should we get rid of the BMI in favor of something else? Is there anything else that measures like the BMI? What else can we use? There's so many questions about it. Um, you know, I think a lot of like regular schmegular people and no clinic, not clinicians are now more aware of the BMI and what it is and are having it impact their life in some ways. Um, so I think that's kind of why a lot of people are kind of talking about or concerned about BMI. Especially in the current context where we're kind of um, challenging a lot of the fat phobic diet culture norms that we've, mm -hmm. it's kind of just been a part of our society for so long. I think a lot of us are kind of collectively challenging those ideas a lot more. But in kind of the healthcare community, BMI is still very much used mm -hmm. and relied upon to handle patients' care. So things are being challenged and we're talking more about whether it's actually useful in managing people's health. Exactly, so today we're gonna to give you the lowdown on the BMI uh, so that you're up to speed, you know what people are talking about when there's these debates and you can kind of, you know, create your own thoughts about whether the BMI is useful and what are the options to replace it if it needs to be replaced. So first of all, what is BMI? BMI is a calculation that takes a person's height and weight into consideration. So the formula is a person's weight in kilograms divided by their height in meters squared. I know that formula very well. That was drilled into us from, I think, day one, pretty yeah. much, of, of nutrition school. <laughs> and through my practicum, definitely used it a lot. So it's supposed to be kind of like an indirect measure of a person's fatness. And basically, by taking the height of the person into consideration, it kind of allows you to assess what, where a person's body weight is at without kind of letting the height kind of skew your perception of that person's level of fatness. Because, you know, as I'm sure we all know, you know, the taller you are, generally speaking, the heavier you would be. So if you were solely looking at only a person's weight and not taking the height into consideration, they might influence how you interpret where the person's body weight is in terms of fatness. Exactly. So imagine we had these same kind of cutoffs that we had with BMI, but we only looked at weight. And let's say the cutoff for, I guess, healthy weight was 170 pounds. Anyone who was like six foot and above would be considered, I guess, in the overweight category. Um, and it wouldn't really give us a good idea of, of kind of, I guess, the body fatness, which is what this was kind of intended to measure basically the BMI you know you do you know put your values into that formula and you'll get a value and basically these values have been split into different groups and they've been kind of assigned different names and also that based on population level data there's kind of an assumed level of risk for different health outcomes that's kind of assumed depending on where you fall in that range. These categories go as follows and it seems a little bit arbitrary just like saying these random numbers out loud but just keep in mind that calculation so it's kilograms over meters squared. So if that end value comes out less than 18.5 you are considered in the underweight category. Um, the normal or healthy weight category depending just on which documents you're reading um, is 18.5 to 24.9 and then um, we have the overweight category which would be 25 to 29.9 they're very precise with these numbers <laughs> and then um, there's three classes of obesity so this is obesity class one which is 30 to 34.9 obesity class two 35 to 39.9 and then obesity class three is anything 40 and above Whew, that was exhausting. It was, it was exhausting. It's, it's 
generally thought that, you know, if you're in that normal or healthy weight category, so that 18.5 to 24.9, it's thought that being in that range is associated with the least amount of health risk. Anything 25 and above, it kind of, as you go higher and higher, it's thought that your risk for poor health outcomes kind of goes up. Interestingly, even being in the underweight category, so being under 18.5, is also associated with increased risks for poor health outcomes. And we're gonna get into that a little bit deeper and later on in the video. It seems like a fancy, dancy calculation, and you think, oh, this must be pretty recent, but it's actually very, very, old. Yes. Um, it was 1835. There we go, 1835. <laughs> I was like, what was I going to say? 1835 by... Adolf Ketlet? Quetlet? Yes. It's on the screen. <laughs> yes. The pronunciation is uh, questionable, but yes, it's spelt like uh, Adolf Quetlet. He was an astronomer, a mathematician, a statistician, so nothing health related, I really. Love, like, I feel like scientists back in the day, they were all this, like, you know, I did astronomy. Let me just come up with this formula. Let me yeah. just, let me do it. Guys, guys, I got this whole health formula. Don't worry. I discovered a star yesterday. I feel like, you know, even like medical doctors are like, I don't know, I just dabble around sometimes. Yeah. I'm such a dabble in medicine. I feel like you can't see Adolf out of context. I know, I know. I agree, I agree. All right, then. You, you hear Adolf, your brain only thinks of one I'm person. Pretty. But no, this is a different dude. Mr. We'll call him Mr. Quetlet. Quetlet from okay. now on. Mr. Quetlet, a man of, a man of, Many, many trades. We won't be talking about him for much it's longer. longer. <laughs> but for he was kind of looking on a population mm -hmm. level. And then Ansel Keys came along in the 1900s. My boy Ansel, you might remember him from two weeks ago. Yeah, he noticed that there actually seemed to be an association between the BMI value and body fatness. So he was, you know, measuring people's body fatness by doing things like skin fold measurements and but like weight density measurements. And he noticed that there was an association with the BMI. So that's kind of where it took off from there and it's become like such an important part of healthcare. That kind of brings us into like what the BMI is used for now. So it's, you know, was developed originally for a population level, uh, you know, evaluation of how the healthy the population is. Um, and it's still used for that now. Um, I know in Canada, we have our Canadian Community Health Survey that happens, I don't think it's on any regular interval. No, I think they it just do it when they, that way. when they feel, feel like it. It was, what, a 2004, 2004, then 2015, which what, is so random. Just 11 years. Yeah. Obviously, 11 year intervals, duh. You know, we still use that. We see, um, you know, BMI used there. And it's really good because it's really easy. Most people know their height and their weight approximately. You can call someone up, say, hey, I'm from the Canadian government. I'm doing a survey. How much do you weigh? How much do you height? What is your height? <laughs> How um, much do you height? And then, you know. You Although studies do show that people tend to overestimate their height and, and underestimate, underestimate their, their weight. weight. But, you know, you get like a brief, like a kind of. You have yeah, an idea. An idea. And then you can also then look at like people that you actually measure yourself and get an idea of how much that estimation is off and then use that to kind of inform your idea of the health of the population. There's also clinical applications, which we use a lot. Yeah, it's often used, uh, you know, with one on one patients, whether it's doctors or dietitians, often to, you know, assess what a person's weight should be or like to recommend weight targets you know whether it's for weight gain or weight loss often it is used in those settings to kind of determine if the person could benefit from gaining weight or benefit from losing weight from my experience working um in like a clinical hospital setting you know there are certain um formulas that are different depending on i guess the weight class of the person so when we're feeding people through their nose because they can't eat anything you know there are studies that show giving some some people like this amount of calories and some people another amount of calories does show benefit for their um, outcomes, especially in a critical care sense. Um, and so when I was in, working in the ICU, that was something that we did look at a lot. It's also used a lot in research settings because, you know, when you're, especially with clinical research where you're using human participants, a lot of times when you're doing research, you need to have, you need to like very much narrow the, types of participants that you're including mm -hmm. in like experimental studies so that you can really be able to isolate certain very like if you're studying um for example in the lab that we used to work at we were studying things like appetite and food intake of you know how certain foods impact those things 
And by you know narrowing you know what BMI range of participants that you recruit, you kind of avoid maybe skewing the results by having confounding variables, you know, with things like body weight and how that influences your hormones, including things like appetite and satiety. There are uh, studies that show that satiety and appetite mechanisms work differently in people who uh, are overweight or obese based off of these same calculations or these same calculations. So we're basing like a lot off of these calculations. So why is BMI used so much? And I think the main reason really is that it's an incredibly easy mm -hmm. thing to use. It's such a simple calculation. You know, like you said, most people do have a general idea of their height and weight. And even if you don't have it, with relatively inexpensive equipment, you can measure those things and kind of quickly do the calculation to get an idea of where the person's at. But, you know, that brings us onto the question is, does it really measure fatness, especially in today's context? Because Ansel Keys, he was 1900s, you know, society has changed, things have changed, and we have better research methods now, we have better research tools. So can we say that we can look at BMI as a measure of body fatness and health. So interestingly, in the majority of the population, there is a very high correlation between BMI value and fatness. So generally speaking, the higher the BMI, the likelihood of the person having high levels of adiposity or high level of fatness is actually quite high. But there are a number of important exceptions. First and foremost, I think it's the one that you hear the most often is like athletes and very highly active people. Muscle weighs a lot. So, you know, if you have more muscle on your body, you're going to be heavier. So that's going to impact that top number and make that your end equation a higher number. So you might have someone who's just really muscular and who has uh, a BMI that would put them in an obese or overweight category. This kind of brings up the fact that BMI is not really meant to be used by, you know, your everyday Joe. It is meant to be used by clinicians and statisticians uh, and using their clinical uh, judgment to kind of be like, okay, well, I'm looking at you, you have a BMI of 31, but in terms of when I measure your skin fold or when I measure this other thing, I can see you don't have a lot of body fatness. On the flip side of that is actually, you know, as you get older, it's very normal for, you know, that lean muscle mass, the, the amount of that muscle mass to go down. And it's very normal for, you know, elderly people to maybe have a high amount of fatness, but because of the reduction in muscle mass, their weight might be kind of lower and might actually put their BMI in the normal weight category, even though they mm -hmm. do have the higher amount of body fat. So even though for the general population and on a population level, there is a high correlation of BMI and body fatness, that may not be true. That isn't true for every single person on an individual level. You see the population benefit, but individuals case by case basis. Next question I think is like, well, why do we even care about fatness? And this is where, you know, it gets the fact that it gets used a lot in healthcare settings, we need to ask, does BMI actually indicate health risk? And that's kind of a complicated question. Even within fatness, there's a lot of variation. So some people, they store a lot of fat in their abdomen. Other people store a lot of fat in their legs or their arms or wherever, wherever else it may be. And we know that all fat is not created equal or all fat distribution is not equal. Typically what we see is that when we break it down, having fat, extra fat in your abdominal area can be, is correlated to higher health risks than having body fat in your limbs, um, your hips and so on and so forth. And the thing is, is that you can't really do anything about that. That's purely up to genetics. Someone might have a lot more body fat and that's more in their legs than someone else who has body fat that's in their abdomen but that first person may be at a lower health risk. And from BMI alone, we don't really capture that in the equation. And the reason that we see that difference in health risk is actually abdominal fat tends to be visceral fat. So it's basically fat around the organs. Mm -hmm. And you know, fat that's more stored on the lower body, it tends it's called subcutaneous fat. And it's kind of just, you know, superficial, just under the skin. 
And that's why we don't really see it having a huge impact on health outcomes. But again, like Leila said, that's not really something that you can do anything about it. It's, it is mostly gen or completely genetic. You know, some people's bodies are more likely to store subcutaneous fat and some people's bodies are more likely to store visceral fat. And we do know that there is a, gen uh, a hormonal component. So um, people's bodies who produce more estrogen, um, tend to store more weight in their legs and their hips and their bum um, and also in breasts if you have breasts. People's bodies who have less estrogen are more likely to store um, fat in the abdominal area. So it's kind of just luck of the draw, I guess. And it is, it is what it is. So keeping all that in mind, what's actually been found is that waist circumference may be a better predictor of health outcomes than BMI. So a lot of times actually healthcare settings will use BMI along with waist circumference to get a better idea of an individual's health risk. But there's actually some research that shows that you know using waist circumference alone is just as useful as using BMI and waist circumference. I think one of the issues with the adoption of this, even though there is so much consistent research that shows this, is that people don't know their waist circumference, you know? That's true, but I feel like in a healthcare, healthcare setting, setting, exactly. you know, the doctor's office, they have a scale, they're measuring your height, they mm -hmm. could measure your waist circumference as well. I, I think in like a hospital setting, maybe harder if people are like unconscious lying down, but like definitely at the doctor. And actually I went to the doctor the other day and they did take my waist circumference. It has been adopted. Yeah, at least by some physicians, which is really promising and showing how people update their practice based off of the research, which is great to see. In terms of, you know, BMI and its correlation with health outcomes, we do see that there is a correlation between, you know, higher BMI being associated with, you know, higher um, triglycerides, higher total cholesterol, higher LDL cholesterol, and lower HDL cholesterol. So generally what that means is that having a higher BMI is associated with higher, having higher risk for things like heart disease. So now we're going to talk about more Tally, aka death. <laughs> um, so these studies are very interesting to look at because basically they just look at like a bunch of people and then they see who died, what age they died, and what their BMI was and kind of just do some statistics and figure out okay what does this mean. This is where there's a lot of variability and some studies say there is no effect uh, so, or some people say some studies are showing that you know overweight um, BMIs actually have a protective effect versus the normal weight BMI. Uh, some studies are showing no, what's happening right now is very consistent. So typically what you see is a J-shaped curve. So if we have on this axis risk of death at like an, any age, it would go J down like this. So the risk of death goes down and then up like this. But kind of where that is varies by study. So there was one study out of the UK that shows, nah, we got it right, this is exactly what it is. But there also have been some studies out of Canada and the United States that show that having um, an overweight uh, BMI does not put you at any additional risk of premature death. It might even be protective, but consistently we see that at the extreme ends, there are uh, higher rates of earlier death. So I think it's worth pointing out at this point that, you know, even though, you know, it's higher BMIs, there tends to be an association with either increased mortality or, you know, higher blood lipids. The BMI shouldn't ever be relied on completely. It shouldn't be used in isolation. So, you know, it's quite possible for someone, even though, you know, the probability might be lower, it's still very possible that someone could be in the normal weight category and still have, you know, blood lipid levels that are higher than might be considered mm -hmm. ideal. So I think it's very important for, you know, healthcare professionals to make sure that we are taking into consideration all the variables and all the measures that we can take and kind of get a holistic picture of where the person's at in terms of current health and you know other risk factors. BMI is just one piece of the picture. When we look at these studies, they're looking at tens of thousands. Even one of the studies in uh, mortality that I looked at looked at three million people. So we can make the associations, but we know that's just one piece of the puzzle and we need to look at people individually as a whole. And it's unfortunate because we do know that that doesn't always happen. Got that some way. lazy clinicians out there. <laughs> uh, weight discrimination in healthcare is a very big problem um, in the sense that I think if you're 
normal weight. A lot of physicians might assume that you're healthy and not really do any other protocols to kind of look at your overall health. And on the flip side, if you are overweight in, in the overweight or obese categories, there might be an assumption that you're unhealthy and you know right away no matter what you're in there for you might be told that you need to lose weight even if all the other measures indicate that you actually are quite healthy yeah i've heard some really like tragic stories of people who are going in for like i don't know this is an extreme example but like a broken arm and the doctor's like you need to lose weight yeah you hear stories of people going in for like a rash or something and the, you know one of the recommendations on the way out is like you need to lose 20 pounds just because someone is overweight or obese doesn't mean that they have poor health behaviors and just because someone is normal weight doesn't mean that they have good health behaviors like for example smoking uh, people who smoke tend to be more in the normal weight category but you know, in these mortality studies I've looked at, they have to exclude smokers because <laughs> that skews the data the complete other way. You know, clinicians were looking at you to change your ways, look at people as individuals, consider the risk factors, but also look at the data that you have in front of you. And the weight bias that we see in healthcare settings is not without consequence because, you know, we talked about that example of people going in for a rash or a broken arm and kind of maybe being dismissed and told to lose weight. That can be very demoralizing and discouraging for people. And that may actually cause people to not seek treatment when they are going through legitimate issues. And that may delay them seeking treatment. I mean, generally speaking, if you're going through something um, physically, generally speaking, the earlier you catch it, it's typically easier to resolve. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when people are being poorly treated in the healthcare setting, they may delay seeking that treatment. And it's thought that that may actually, on some level, contribute to the poor health outcomes of uh, that's that people that are in the overweight or obese category deal with. And not only that, it you know, weight bias skews physicians' perceptions. So maybe they're having a legitimate issue that has nothing to do with weight. And because the physician sees, oh, this person is overweight, I'm judging them as fat, that must be the root of their issues. I'll just tell them to lose weight and may not do any further investigations. And that, again, you know, can lead to someone not getting the treatment they need for even longer and result in, you know, the worst health outcome. So it's kind of like, what came first, the chicken or the egg kind of thing. That's the unfortunate reality of having BMI so prevalent in our healthcare system. What I find really interesting, um, and this is something that has kind of come to light more recently, but there are actually ethnic variations when it comes to the usability or the validity of the BMI as well. So the BMI was kind of built based on, you know, studying Caucasian and Hispanic populations. But we are seeing that, you know, especially in South Asian populations, that we're seeing increased risk for certain health outcomes, even at lower BMI. So BMIs that are considered normal, we're still seeing higher levels of heart disease and diabetes. And the reason for that is because it seems that South Asians are actually less, you know, genetically speaking, less able to store subcutaneous fat. So what ends up happening is that a lot of people from South Asians or South Asian descent tend to store more of that visceral fat. And we, as we talked about before, that visceral fat is actually what's associated with a lot of the poor health outcomes. And this is actually called normal weight obesity. Mm -hmm. Based on that observation, the suggested cutoff for South Asians is actually 23 and higher being indicative of higher risk for poor health outcomes. Dr. Oz, you know, we have, we, have, we can make a whole series on Dr. Oz and what he has to say, but he used to talk about TOFI, which is, Thin on the outside, fat on the inside. Oh my god, so it's like skinny fat. Exactly. Okay. And you know, he applied it, I think, more to even more than just um, the uh, South Asian population. He applied it to people who had poor health behaviors um, and, you know, be, even though they had a smaller body, might have more adiposity or more risk of um, health outcomes. And I think that's actually a very important, like, you know, as problematic as Dr. Oz is, I think it is a very important point because like, you know, telling someone to lose weight isn't really a thing that someone, it's not like, oh, lose weight. Okay, yeah, tomorrow I'll go out and lose weight yeah. kind of thing. Well, when we look at it, like health behaviors, a lot of them can help with weight loss, but also independently of weight loss do show benefits to health outcomes. So like, you know, if you are a physician, again, we're going back to looking at the whole person, you know, telling someone to lose weight is not gonna be that helpful, but maybe, 
sending them over to a dietitian or working with them on their diet, working on with them to set goals about physical activity might be more useful to their health overall than being like lose weight. And then that person might go on like a crash diet. And you know, if you go back and look at our videos on weight loss and calories, you can see that that definitely doesn't have a good outcome for health or long-term weight loss either. We also see age-related variations because with older adults, we actually see that being kind of in the overweight category actually seems to be more protective than being in the what's called the normal or healthy weight category. With older adults, we see that they've shifted the normal weight category again up to 23.5 to 27.5. In these populations, having that higher BMI is actually protective against all cause mortality. So basically, all reasons for death. I think part of the reason is that having more weight um, actually helps preserve your bone integrity mm -hmm. as well, yeah. which of course we know is very important for mortality. So we've noticed that the BMI clearly has quite a bit of limitations. So are there any other alternatives and specifically, you know, easy to measure, inexpensive alternatives? And there actually is, and we kind of talked about one of them before, which is the waist circumference. But there's actually another one as well, which is the waist to height ratio. And again, that takes into account the person's height, but also takes into account abdominal adiposity, which again, like we said before, is kind of a bigger contributor to poorer health outcomes. That seems to make a lot of sense. Because I know with waist circumference, oftentimes we just have a cutoff, but you know, as we talked about with weight, if someone's like seven foot tall, like in terms of ratios, you know, Exactly. Yeah. They're going to have a larger waist circumference, Exactly, but it may not be indicative of body fatness. I'm curious to see how, as we advance in our careers, how that's applied in, in the field. In research though, we have a few more options depending on the funding and the resources available at the research facility. At our research facility that we worked at, we had something called the Bod Pod. It was like this futuristic high-tech egg that you <laughs> climbed inside and it used an air displacement plethysmography, which basically they just pump a bunch of air in there and see how dense you are and then use that to calculate uh, body fatness. Um, and you know, that actually is a measure of adiposity. So it's not just guessing based off of weight and height, it's using your body density to tell us adiposity. We also have other tools now like DEXA. And you know, we see quite a few other tools on, on the market that are making adiposity actually you know measurable unfortunately i don't think it's necessary because these pieces of equipment are really expensive yes. and they take quite a bit of you know maintenance and they're not quick to use necessarily you, not quick at all to use i spent many a good day doing bot pods for lots like, of calibration mm -hmm. and maintenance maintenance time consuming stuff. So, yeah. I mean, of course, you know, it's not necessarily readily accessible in places like hospitals or family doctor's offices, which is why I think there was such a reliance on BMI, but perhaps moving forward, you know, like you said, you know, places are adopting waist circumference. And as we move forward, you know, maybe the waist to height ratio will also be more commonly used. After talking about BMI today, we know BMI is useful on a population level. It's great for research. We've learned a lot using it, but it may be time to kick the BMI out in favor of something like weight circumference or uh, waist to height ratio uh, to give us a better idea of health outcomes on a uh, individual level. Thank you so much for watching. Please be sure to like, comment, and subscribe and hit that notification bell so you never miss a video and follow us on our Instagram and our TikTok. Thanks for watching. Bye. Bye.